Hi everyone. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the way we in the the Cam Free Net Neutrino experiment are uh, using Python. And uh, first off, uh, come on. No. Uh, for some 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 brief introduction. So this is basically um, uh, a shared effort between me and and Tomas. Um, we're both PhD students in the and the Cam Free Net uh, collaboration, uh, which is uh, which I'll introduce in a second, and uh, both have a bit of a Python background, uh, but actually a bit of a very different focus on what we actually work on. Uh, for example, Thomas is more on, on the data acquisition, monitoring, and uh, reconstruction side of things, and I'm working more on, on, on the like, high-level data analysis stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, but first of all, first, first uh, since we're probably uh, most here are not particle physicists, let's uh, introduce what, what are actually neutrinos and the can free net. What, what are we talking about? Okay, so neutrinos are uh, elementary particles um, and are basically high kind of ghost particles. Uh, they are, um, they move with the speed of light, are very hard to detect. Um, they basically fly through the entire Earth without, uh, like, like it's nothing. And uh, there's actually a lot of them. So uh, if you hold your, your thumb up up to the sun, there's for each second like 65 million uh, bikes through your thumb at each second. So, um, so they're very, very numerous, but they look like they go, like goes. They, they don't care anything for, for matter or anything. Uh, and they're also very interesting from a particle physics standpoint. Um, so um, there's just not just this one kind of neutrino, but they basically come uh, in, in three types or flavors, as we call them. And uh, the weird thing about them is, is if they fly uh, through the Earth universe, then they just change their identity and fly. Um, and this is not, not, not completely understood, so and this is something that's very interesting for us, but I think it's just a matter. Um, but this is another bit uh, of an no obscure thing to uh, neutrinos. Um, which is why I came from that's called neutrino telescope. And uh, for the reason that they just don't care and fly through everything and um, don't care if there's a specific uh, big planet or something in the way, you can actually use them in, uh, as an astronomic messenger and actually do astronomy with them. So I don't know if you have a bit, but uh, um, for me, if astronomy, then you usually do astronomy with, uh, let's say, uh, with, with light, with optical light, you can see in the star. Or with maybe radio astronomy, um, as in the plots up there. Um, but neutrinos have a very nice property that if you have some for instance source, for example, uh, the, the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, and uh, then anything that comes out of it just just gets absorbed or deflected in some way. But neutrinos just escape it and always point to the source. Um, so they're basically a perfect um, vehicle for, for doing astronomy. Um, so the only real challenge is then to, to just find them to detect them because they are so elusive. And so if you want to actually detect them, you usually need very, very large uh, detectors. A large instrument in water. You're talking something like a cubic kilometer of, of um, usually something like water or ice. And um, uh, most of the neutrinos just, just fly through this, this large volume, but, but very rarely they actually interact. So they, they hit an atom somewhere and then um, deposit a lot of energy. And uh, uh, the, the production of this interaction, this is uh, something with, which is, uh, we can actually see. This is a, still has a lot of energy and it travels at very high speeds, um, pretty much a speed of light. And uh, if you're, for example, in water or ice, um, these this, uh, interaction products have the funny property that they um, move faster than the speed of light. Uh, in the speed of light, like medium, for example. And um, uh, whenever a particle, does, a particle, it emits a very faint uh, light, which is called a rank of light. And uh, this is light you can actually measure. Um, so this is sketched here at the bottom. Right? If you see down the right, there's a neutrino coming from the lower left, hitting an atom or something, and produces a particle, and this, this, this flies multiple kilometers. And uh, in, in its wake, it leaves this, like the, the shockwave of supersonic flight, it leaves um, a cone of, of blue light. And you can actually detect this light um, with light detectors, with photomultiplayers, which are here sketched as um, blue cubes on these lines. Um, 
So the best way to do actually do this is, is take a large body of water, for example, uh, the ocean floor, and uh, put lots of water multipliers in there. And this is basically what you do. Um, so what you're using is uh, you're using a lot of uh, PMTs. You can see on the upper left, just um, if, a, if a photon or a very, very uh, weak light signal hits it, produces an electric path you can measure it. And you put many of these on the, like, uh, this, this round structure we call DOM. We put many of these onto, a, um, onto long cables on lines. And uh, then we drop it at the bottom of the sea. Um, for example, of one of the sites where we're doing this is uh, just off the coast of Sicily. Um, and they came to the Italy side. And uh, so when we're doing this, we got this, this uh, long string of, 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 yeah, of, of optical modules. And uh, the way we deployed this is like quite funny. So we, we rolled them up in the nice in, uh, in the big ball, dropped them at the bottom of, uh, of the ocean. And then because uh, there's a balloon attached to this, this unfurls and rolls up uh, like an inverse JoJo. <laughs> and then you get um, one very nice element of the optical modules, uh, which can then take the point light in the bottom of the ocean, as you should see on the right. Um, there's, and, uh, in the sector itself, there's not just one line, but there's really, really many of them. Um, there's something that, because we need very large volume, we uh, completely instrument um, a cubic kilometer of, of seawater um, with these uh, floating multipliers. And then um, whenever we get in something like a, in such a neutrino event, for example, here it comes from below, comes through the earth because it can just fly through the earth. And somewhere it just hits the bedrock, produces a particle, and this thing then makes a cone of light. Uh, actually, we do not only have one of these uh, big array setups, but there's multiple of them. And uh, the game free inside. So uh, I already mentioned there's this one uh, off the coast of Sicily down there. And, um, but there's actually uh, two more sites or two more sites being planned since we're uh, currently uh, in the process of constructing the sector. Um, so one is this off the coast of France uh, near Toulon and one, the other one is uh, off the coast of Greece near Pilots. Okay. Um, so if you have this kind of interaction and then all this, um, these results from the neutrino detection depositing a light in the detector, how does it actually look like? What do we measure? And uh, what do we actually see is um, collected charge in these multipliers, or basically the intensity of light that, was, that hit this photon particle. So you um, know where the, um, a photon hit a photon multiplier, you know the direction a photon multiplier is facing, how much light has collected, and the time. And you can see already on this uh, left is plot, this, this already looks looks like a thing. So this looks like a big circular blob, a big spherical blob of light. And uh, actually not all events. Uh, these events are actually quite big because we're inter instrumenting a cubic kilometer. It has um, an overlay of one of these events, uh, which uh, this is one of the highest energy events uh, ever measured with such a telescope and overlay here over a city, and you can see it's it's, it's enormous. It's basically spanning multiple city blocks. Uh, so we're really talking time detectors here. Uh, okay, there's uh, actually two kinds of things we measure here. Uh, this is uh, actually the first part where the Python comes in. Um, so there's this, this, this circular uh, or spherical event, um, which are um, and there are these very uh, elongated, kilometers long um, track like signatures of light. This is simply because um, if you have the, the, the relic from the, the neutrino hitting something, um, so you basically have two possibilities. Some particles fly for kilometers, still at the speed of light, and the deposit light all along the way, and they can see, okay, and you can actually see by eye and see, okay, this particle came from this in this direction. And so here, if you should read the color codes, right at uh, the left front, where it came from below, because it goes from this greenish to blue. And, uh, but uh, yeah, and the other thing is just uh, the case that some particles just don't get very far in water, it just immediately get captured and it just deposits lots of light, but it's, it's all basically in one place. Uh, so this is basically very simple. Um, but to do, actually do this kind of stuff, you need to do a, a lot of, of physics and, and uh, uh, not, not only the particle physics modeling these um, interactions in the water, but uh, you basically know, need to know everything you're working with. You need to um, 
one, one interaction. You need to model your entire electronics, your entire data acquisition software from the um, electronics that actually measure the light through the, um, and all these, these kind of things. And the optical properties off of the, um, the glass that is protecting the sphere so they don't implode from the, the huge pressure we got down there. Um, but of course, yeah, the optical properties, you need, need to model them, you need to know them. And uh, you need to do, um, since you can't basically write this down as the formula, um, we're simulating our entire detector chain. Uh, yeah, we do doing it on the color simulation of everything up from, from the, the very basic particle physics at the source, maybe the electric center, up to the electronic signal we actually get out of the detector. And to, to complicate this even further, there's just a lot of things you need to keep track of. Uh, for example, because we uh, are deploying the entire thing in, in the bottom of the sea, we obviously have something like a sea current. And these um, light detectors are mounted on cables. So if there's sea current, it is, um, they, they move off the, the stream. So they change their position. You need kind of track of it where they are, or they, they can rotate, rotate around their X. And so we we'll basically put compasses, electrical compasses, on each of these modules to know which direction it's facing. And uh, so this is all kind of a mess. You have uh, radioactive decays in water, you have um, maritime organisms um, generating light. So it's just really unfortunate because you're measuring light, but then you get some deep sea organisms, which are sometimes just um, beside that another very good time that they all um, spontaneously light up and, and uh, yeah, make a lot of light pollution down there. And uh, so there's another challenge um, because um, we're talking about particles traveling at the fight here. If you do a bit of the math, um, you need um, a very, very high timing accuracy because each of these particles take like a nanosecond. Um, so the particle almost uh, flies half a meter, and uh, our optical models are like a meter big something like this. So you need to measure this very, very um, precisely. And uh, so what we basically do is we flash um, light sources like LED or LED, LED things. Um, now all these work and uh, uh, then we can calibrate it with uh, our detector. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is for, so very much about uh, neutrinos and neutrino detecting things. And uh, but I think the, the part where we are learned and talking about these things um, because we're interested in how uh, we can use Python and this kind of thing. And uh, but it's actually not, not quite that simple uh, because this is a very, very large processing chain from simulating everything to, uh, uh, um, to doing the actual um, from where that runs on the data acquisition hardware and everything. But there's lots of calls, lots of different frameworks. Um, so it's, it's quite difficult to actually get started with analysis. So uh, we have lots of... Uh, we have lots of Python code, uh, lots of our data acquisition and, and um, analysis software put into C++ plus frameworks, homemade C++ plus frameworks. A lot of the simulation code is still written in Fortran. Um, <laughs> and this also means you have a lot of data formats that you need to, you need to get around. So uh, uh, many people use this, this C++ framework from CERN, which is for root, uh, which you may have heard of. And, uh, I personally very like uh, for for a civilization of the large amounts of numerical data we have we use it five tables. Um, then you got um, central database which holds all the least calibration um, things and everything uh, which needs to be queried, you know, which which gives you out ASCII. And there's a lot lot of um, home built uh, binary formats in the data acquisition and in the analysis and everything. Um, so the, the first challenge to actually do anything is to, to get data of uh, out of the, the, the thing, and for this we uh, developed a unified interface for data processing, which is of course written in Python. And uh, so we christened it cam 3 um, which uh, is, is basically an approach for a very general event processing chain. And the, 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 in the name itself, um, already the concept of this, that you have, um, you're building a pipeline system, I'll show this in the moment. Um, and you pump events through this, this uh, full chain of module. And uh, so I'll show this on the next slide. And uh, yeah, because we're doing numerics, we're using NumPy and Cypher. Um, but, but the basic idea of this is very um, So here's an extra example. Uh, we're doing, um, when we're using uh, absolutely radioactive decays in the water to calibrate our detector. Um, 
But you can already see the layer. So uh, first we need to do something like we de declare a pipeline, and then step after step we attach different modules to this chain, and they all do different things. So the first thing here is um, actually uh, reading it from the live detector. Um, so this is, is something uh, has a server running on some uh, one of the data acquisition machines uh, at this 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 thousand this is port. And so this is, uh, the first thing just receives data from this, this, this service on there. Uh, the next step is because it's some, some home written uh, binary format, uh, we, we've written our own parser for this kind of data, so um, that you can actually put it into a nice form that you can actually do, uh, use. And then you do, can do an action analysis um, from this kind you're doing, um, looking for a uh, potassium 40 decays, which is a rate of fast hope, and you can use it then, then to um, yeah, to basically correct the, the relative timing of all these electronics uh, up to down to 0.2 transits, which is pretty impressive. Um, uh, but you basically just, uh, it's just 300 modules are uh, all using NumPy underneath and uh, to do all these kind of things. And uh, yeah, in the last step, you just, just want some kind of status, um, maybe some more, more profiling, and dump everything to disk. Um, yeah. Um, so this, this is was uh, an example for, from the um, calibration setting itself, but there's um, really a large number of modules. So you, very basic things like file uh, input output, um, reading our lots of data formats to um, making queries to our central database, um, to our central Oracle database, um, do this kind of calibration things that we just talked about, uh, or actually running reconstruction codes which try to uh, extract. Um, the origin, original information, original properties of, of the, the event you're looking at, and uh, simple things like plotting. And so this is quite quite a powerful tool, and uh, this is already quite widely used in our analysis. Um, so the, 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 the API for this is also rather simple. So if we talk of an event, it is just a simple thing. So we're just basically uh, having a list of modules, and we have a dictionary for module to module, and each. Uh, thing does something with the model. For example, here you just define a simple class and you say, okay, uh, in your main method, uh, just uh, if we have a, a collection of hits, uh, of a photon hits, um, this event and take them and run your favorite reconstruction algorithm or really something on this. And then give it back so the next event can do it. And this is basically an entire model. And then attach this to this custom made uh, analysis chain. And uh, because we are basically um, uh, building the uh, this framework on, on Napa and Siphon, and it also gives us the power to um, actually do a very, very thin Siphon wrapper for all the C++ routines and interface into our, our internal C++ framework. Uh, so you can do actual analysis, but don't have to write C++ code. You just use the API for Siphon, uh, which is, of course, very useful. And uh, from there, once you've got this kind of uh, kind of thing set up that can read files and you can actually do, do things. Um, yeah, you basically got a whole web of the PyData uh, infrastructure for you. And uh, so this, is, this really goes through the all levels of, of, of what we're doing. So you can do very low level analysis where you just uh, um, may or may not have heard of uh, pandas. So you just um, talk to your detector data and this nice HDFR table, which we read with PyTales. And um, yeah, just Get the hits out of the file, and we say, okay, we want only hits which are triggered, which are marked that we want to use, and just, just do a simple system of this. Um, so, this is a very basic example, um, but this is also uh, a bit of, uh, um, used for the entire uh, live monitoring chain. For example, yes, this is a screenshot of um, a server that, that reads out its detector um, information, sends it uh, um, with via ODP packets to the uh, web interface, and then you and do these kinds of interactive plots, uh, interactive live plots um, with JavaScript. Um, so, which is pretty neat, neat useful, uh, since um, we really can't of obviously be present at short, short station of the data all the time. So, we can just do a, a monitor or detector for this web interface. It's pretty neat. And so, there's not only this interactive field, but there's lots of um, a detector status displays and calibration, which, which all basically use this kind of framework. Um, you can see, okay, uh, and in this one, um, we see that the detector is running, or uh, one line is currently uh, black here, so this one's offline, unfortunately. 
Um, but it's just basically a lot of the, um, you know, of these analysis tools, which I would all use framework uh, on the, underneath. Um, what's also quite useful is uh, the, for this, uh, frameworks uh, allows us to pull directly past the database or so, um, uh, via REST API and it returns some kind of ASCII format then which we can parse, simply drop it into pandas data frames, which is very comfortable. And uh, so this, this thing, which looks a bit like, like it's like art, um, is basically a, a plot uh, for one of our lines for the compass data for uh, a wide range of times. It's, it's like, I will use it just uh, for lines of pandas or something. Um, but yeah, this allows us um, to do all of the, uh, these, these daily analysis tasks and monitoring tasks in a very easy way. And uh, yeah, apart from that, um, we are um, using the, the same interface also in other things. For example, I already showed you this is kind of event. Um, this is also written in some Python tooling. Uh, this, this one here uses uh, PyOpenGL and then Glot um, to give you this kind of nice detection display. And, uh, and then the newer um, you know, version we moved the entire thing uh, from help and GL um, because it's um, not so pleasant to work with. Um, we put this like uh, in, in line with the other monitoring tools and uh, brought a web GL um, implementation of this. So this is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so the, um, but you're not restricted to the very basic analysis tasks. So like, like I said, um, we have a lot of C++ um, um, framework code. And uh, yeah, so you can see this, uh, a bunch of these reconstruction algorithms where you just uh, see this collection of a hidden detector and from it to you, um, because you're doing simulation, you roughly know how, um, if an event is, in, uh, is actually something like this, it will produce a hit pattern like this and this, and you can go backwards from this and uh, do the kind of, kind of uh, likelihood fit or something um, direction. And uh, yeah, and the most of the heavy lift thing is written in C and C++, and you just do the, the um, steering in Python, and everybody's happy. Um, yeah. So when uh, you've done all this low level work and you um, go to the point where you can actually do like statistical analysis and actual physics, uh, you still can use the same tools. So just, um, especially for this, this kind of exploratory data analysis work, um, we're very, very fond of, of using Jupyter for this kind of thing, especially you do um, a lot of the, these one-off analysis uh, where you just uh, want to look at, at some kind of solution here. Um, uh, yeah, just for example here, a little look at the angular resolution. So you just say, okay, uh, plot me this quantity here, and, and I, know, I want it uh, faceted by this energy, and then say, okay, um, yeah, just split the entire data frame by, by this quantity, and then plot it for a split. And uh, I'm personally very happy with this, this kind of interface because um, until uh, some tools like like pandas have been uh, basically writing these kinds of analysis change as uh, 2,000 long um, NumPy scripts, which is uh, not quite optimal. Um, but yeah, so we really got to do well of the Pi data here and uh, ecosystem for you. Uh, of, for example, if you do a more advanced statistical analysis, you can not only fit the, the, the distributions uh, at the bottom here, but you can also uh, um, uh, do like, the machine learning algorithms with this. And with this, you can uh, be using pandas. Uh, so it's, it's um, I'm not pretty much my step enough with how, how easy all this is. So you just uh, take your HD file, file, pull all your real two pandas tables, and uh, okay, just feed them into your favorite machine learning model at the bottom. Um, yeah, so um, whenever we speak about machine learning, uh, we mostly use it um, if we have a particle and have already estimated which direction was the original neutrino coming from, what energy did it have. And um, this is obvious, so it's a kind of error. So, um, but if you, you've got usually multiple estimates for, for example, for the direction of the neutrino, and so you can um, combine them using, using uh, simple machine learning. And uh, for example, this is uh, um, an example from the particle identification analysis where you just um, take this display reconstruction information into a machine learning model, for example, a random forest, and then the, the model predicts, okay, how likely is this um, 
events to be an elect, uh, machine of this type or a machine of this type. You say, um, it already looks pretty good because uh, red is this here. I uh, should always go to one, blue to, to zero. So I'm quite happy with that. Uh, inside this is clip here. Okay. And uh, yeah, for this, is where we are for these very simple tasks like creating random points or linear models, we must be using scikit learn, um, which is really, really um, wonderful framework for this kind of thing. And uh, they are um, also um, for a bit, bit more involved analysis of this kind of using um, Keras or other Fiano or neural networks libraries. Um, and uh, yeah, from that, it actually gets, gets uh, rather uh, wild. <laughs> Um, oh no, this plot should have been like, I'm sorry, this is plot should have been like uh, two slides ago. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me go back. So, um, because we are basically on a tuner telescope, we also want to do uh, some kind of astronomy too. Um, and, uh, one of the things for partner is whatever your task you have, for example, I want to do an astronomical current transformation. I want to fit. Um, this 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 distribution. Um, there's usually already a pipe package available for this kind of thing, and uh, yeah. So we're basically, um, in this case, uh, generating um, um, random events and uh, comparing this this to a signal from the galactic center. So this is also like like uh, three three lines of of fast, which is really beautiful. And uh, whoops, just compile this. Uh, let's do that. Uh, bear with me for a second. Let's, uh, I want to slide this cut off. Okay, there we go. And um, yeah, this is a, um, like I said, we're basically using um, uh, Python for the entire stack, and then the, the part that they actually get divided. Um, so because uh, we've also been a bit caught by this just, um, deep learning hype. That is um, <laughs> the community. So we were also doing some kind of things. Um, so if, if you remember, we got this, this kind of, of um, three-dimensional um, distribution of photon hits. And uh, we saw uh, somebody else said, hey, this, this looks a bit like image data. So you can um, take this kind of event and then do, do a projection of it. And it is basically an image. And then um, you're, 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 you're treating this as like, uh, yeah, you, you're basically just taking a conf net and then throwing it on, on your, um, on your event data. And then you get a prediction out, oh, okay, this is uh, a, a notion of this in this pipe and, or of this in this one. And, uh, pretty nice. Um, but yeah, that's basically uh, all I have before. This is, um, yeah, but in it of this is this is just a very brief overview talk. Um, in general, we've, we've been um, very, very happy with the use of, of, of can uh, net and Python. And uh, this is really used throughout the entire um, entire analysis chain from raw data acquisition up to the, like, the most high-level um, astronomy and machine learning um, things. And uh, yeah, well, if you're interested in finding more about can net and uh, or, or the, the physics band, this kind of thing, I basically put here the, the link to our um, a lot of interest, so we can read this in a lot more detail, uh, but less on, uh, detail on the Python side, more on the physics. And uh, yeah, well, if you're interested in the kind of Python code we're writing here, um, I invite you to check out this uh, Camp Free Pipe uh, framework, which I'll link to the box here. And well, if you've got any questions about us, you just write us an email. And uh, that's all I have so far. Thank Thanks. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, uh... So now we have uh, five more minutes uh, for some questions. Are we, anyone? Hi, I want, thank you for all the details. Um, I'd like to know if um, the data acquired in this experiment are um, available online somewhere, like even the old one to, to check out. Um, I didn't quite, if what is available somewhere, I didn't catch that part of the, the question. Excuse me. Yeah, the, um, um, the data acquired in the detectors, if they are... The raw data. Sorry? Um, um, we're, um, we're, 
Uh, not quite yet. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, still in the state of the constructing data detector. And uh, so we are also planning on, on releasing the, the, the data later publicly um, as, as part of, of the, the analysis we're publicating. But uh, currently, you're, um, it's unfortunately, it's, it's not available publicly yet. Um, so, yeah. There, there's plan to, to share it in the future when uh, it will run? So, I'm sorry? <laughs> There, there's, um, yeah. uh, sorry, you have to get uh, closer to the microphone. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's any plan to to open the data in the future where there will be a label? Um, yeah, there's a plan, but like I said, um, we did not construct the full detector yet. And um, so there's a plan. Uh, once we... Um, yeah, basically, complete the construction and then taking that data with the, the full building block and then to make this data publicly available. Um, so, but what we're also doing is we're collaborating with um, other experiments. For example, if you see some kind of um, interesting event from a from direction of a known uh, office of special stores, we send uh, alerts to other experiments. But um, I, just, I just, just can't, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the exact details. Except that, that we plan to release the data at some point. Okay, so Maurice, uh, thank you so much. And uh, then, uh, Thanks for having me. See you next time physically here.